Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's del delightful to see you so early on an otherwise near vacant Rice campus, the graduations having been held. Uh, summer mode is now approaching, both climate-wise and uh, in terms of the university. But the activities of the Baker Institute will be continuing um, through May and the very beginning of June before we too cycle down for the summer, barring breaking news events in which case we'll, we'll do what we can to provide the same kind of briefings and opportunity for discussion uh, that we do during the academic year. This is the 30th anniversary year for the Baker Institute. I think most of you in this room uh, know that. We will be commemorating uh, that anniversary in uh, October uh, with an event, details of which, date of which we will be providing uh, subsequently that I think will be of great interest to Houston, to Texas, uh, and to a broader uh, interested community in foreign policy, national security policy. Uh, but today's event, uh, like many we have had over the past months, uh, notably Bill Burns and former ambassador uh, to Russia, John Sullivan's presentation, will focus on Russia's war in the Ukraine. Uh, it is a topic which I think does need uh, to be discussed uh, by the American public uh, by those who have experience in the area. Uh, it is of critical importance in a strategic and in a long-term sense to the United States, to our allies, um, and to the citizens of all countries involved. This is a co-sponsored event with the American Academy of Diplomacy's uh, Joseph Sisko Forum. Uh, Joe Sisko, uh, a colleague and friend of, of many of us in this room, uh, was a senior State Department official, uh, Near East and beyond, um, the generosity of whose family has contributed to our ability to hold this event. Um, annually, the American Academy for Diplomacy, based in Washington, D.C., holds public conversations, just as we do, um, on pertinent themes in U.S. diplomacy and on foreign policy. That was what Joe Sisko dedicated his career to. It is what uh, those of us speaking today uh, and I have dedicated our careers to. So a very appropriate occasion. We thank the American Academy for Diplomacy as we thank uh, the Cisco Forum and the Cisco family for their support for this. I'm going to be introducing uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, Ron Newman. Ron Newman is a colleague and friend of decades standing. He was our ambassador to Bahrain, he was our ambassador to Afghanistan, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Near East South Asia Affairs, ambassador to Algeria, and directed Northern Gulf Affairs back in the days when there was such an office, uh, and was Deputy Chief of Mission, both in the United Arab Emirates and in Yemen. Uh, like me, uh, Ron had a long and extraordinary career in Near East and related areas. And Ron, delighted to have you here today as head president of the American Academy. Our distinguished panelists today uh, are Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, who is not here in your senatorial capacity, but as ambassador to NATO. And Kay, you and I worked extraordinarily closely over some extremely complex issues during your tenure in NATO. And I do not flatter you, but I do in saying you were among the most extraordinary diplomats I have ever had the pleasure of working with. And the, <laughs> and I will speak only in the, the most modest of terms, the diplomatic complexities of NATO are unlike that of virtually any other mission the United States has overseas. Uh, it, it is a multinational entity. The national politics that play in day-to-day -day NATO interactions, NATO policy formulation, or lack thereof, um, require the most deft, expert, skilled, and persistent patient handling. It is frustrating from the beginning. It's overcoming that frustration. And uh, Kay will be talking uh, today on the NATO-related issues, Ukraine, what did it mean, what does it mean, what will it mean, depending on the resolution of the conflict, 
for NATO for the alliance. Uh, we also have Doug Lute. Lieutenant General Lute had both an extraordinary military leadership um, career, but also was a close colleague and friend in his work over many national security challenges the U.S. had, notably Iraq, where he and I worked extremely closely, uh, and then in Afghanistan. Uh, Doug retired in 2010, but having been not only a senior uh, Pentagon official, but also assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor, uh, worked in the NSC South Asia shop, was present at the creation and at the conclusion of the policy review or reviews on Afghanistan, uh, as well as all of Iraq, including its end game as well. Uh, he was ambassador to NATO from 2013 to 2017, so any problems which Kay encountered can be attributed to Doug's predecessor, not, not to him. It was all fine. Yeah, it was all fine when you left, which is the classic ambassadorial comment. Gosh, you know, I didn't see that when I left post, so. Doug, delighted to have you here also for a discussion of NATO as well as Afghanistan, because I think there may well be interest beyond Ukraine in that question as well during the Q's and A's session. And then we have not least Bill Taylor. Bill Taylor is vice president of the Europe and Russia Center at the U.S. Institute for Peace in Washington, the building right across the street from the Department of State with which this Baker Institute is now cooperating and collaborating closely on a variety of issues. And Bill, in that capacity, uh, we're delighted to have you here. USIP is an extraordinary institution. The work it does um, overseas is exceptional. Uh, Y'all were in a bunker in Baghdad during much of the time that, that we all were there and served. Um, but you're there. You're there in conflict areas. You're there trying to resolve conflicts, to prevent them from happening, and to give cogent thought, as we do, not just to the problem sets, but to the potential resolutions for those problems. And that's an extraordinary undertaking also in a fact-based, nonpartisan fashion. Bill was ambassador to the Ukraine from 2006 to 2009 and, and has perceptions on Ukraine, its history, why we and Russia got things so wrong in the assessments that were made just prior to the Russian invasion and where we go from here. So with those introductions and my encouragement to all of you uh, during the Q&A session to ask all the questions you may have of our extraordinary panel here, I will turn it over to Ambassador Ron Newman. Ron, over to you. Thank you, David. That was an extremely warm introduction. Reminded me slightly of a time when the uh, former Egyptian foreign minister, Amr Musa, came to Washington and the uh, uh, Egyptian-American community had a dinner for him and an extremely um, warm welcome, after which Amr Musa said, well, in that introduction, there was some exaggeration, but not more than is acceptable. <laughs> so. I thank you very much for that, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I just want to take one minute to say, uh, first of all, thank you uh, to you, to Baker Institute, uh, for having us here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. The, uh, just a, a moment of commercial interruption for the Academy. Uh, the American Academy of Diplomacy is now 40 years old. It was started by people like Henry Kissinger and Ellsworth Bunker. Um, and uh, various luminaries of the, of the period. George Kennan was a founding member of the Academy. And it remains a small institution of former senior diplomatic practitioners, not all career officers, but including uh, political appointees, including uh, some military, some former directors of AID, uh, and, but all people who have practiced the business of diplomacy with foreigners at senior levels. And it really has two missions these days. One is to talk to Americans about why diplomacy is important and what it is, why it's worth supporting. We have a couple of podcasts, if you're interested, we have one called The General and the Ambassador, uh, because most people think they know more about the military than about the diplomats. Um, and another called American Diplomat. 
And our other function is to uh, study various issues and suggest to the State Department how it might do things better. Of course, being out, we have lots of ideas of how it might do things better. Um, but uh, one of the differences between the academy and a think tank or university uh, is that when a think tank or a university has published the results of their study, they're done with a project. And in our case, we have sometimes turned to working with the Congress and the administration and seeking implementation. Uh, Last year, we were, have been working particularly hard on business of getting our diplomats a little more out on the street outside fortress embassies where they have been too confined, mostly by political constraints, but also uh, with the fears of a law that we thought needed to be changed, and we spent the last year working, and I'm very happy to say we got it changed. Anything that you can get done in writing law in today's climate is, I think, worthy of praise. So that's the Academy in a nutshell. But the purpose here today is to start off with a conversation with Ambassador Hutchinson and myself uh, about our issues. So, Kay, if I could welcome you to... Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing this with us. It's a real delight to have you. Well, here. let me say, first of all, um, it is so wonderful to be here. This is such a special place. This Baker Institute has been fabulous for Houston, fabulous for Texas and America, and to see so many uh, friends that I have known for so long. I started my career here in Houston. And I just want to say, last point, um, thank you for co-sponsoring. Um, but I am so fortunate to be here with David Satterfield. And when I heard he was going to be the next president of the Baker Institute, I was so happy. Because what he said is so true. He was at Turkey. I was at NATO. And as all of you can imagine, we had a lot of conversations about what was going on, what was going on there, what was going on at NATO, and I just felt like he was a soulmate uh, there as we were dealing with all of the issues. And then to have my former, uh, the, the one who left all the problems for me to solve, it was just great, <laughs> great to have him here. Uh, and he was wonderful to welcome me because I followed him uh, in office. And so you'll hear from Doug Lute, and uh, I'm so fortunate. And then I'm such an admirer of you, Ambassador Taylor, uh, because Ambassador Taylor uh, was ambassador to Afghanistan. And then when there was a uh, a lot of turmoil and the ambassador had left and Ukraine has been so important. Did I say Afghanistan? Ukraine. Um, and uh, it was so important. We were dealing with Ukraine at NATO when I was there. Um, and so this ambassador uh, agreed to come back to Ukraine uh, because we needed uh, an experienced person to sort of bring things back into order and you came back and thank you so much for that and I've been watching um, all of us talking about Ukraine all of us are on the interview circuit uh, to talk about Ukraine so anyway uh, thank you all for coming thank you all for being on the panel and I'm sorry I have to leave right away I have to catch a flight to Washington uh, so thank you for letting me go first David so thank you and what is your hard stop um, I think it's 9:50 uh, ish. Um, okay, no, we got, we got plenty of time. I just want to. We don't want you to miss Henry Kissinger's hundredth birthday. I know. I'm going back for Henry Kissinger's hundredth birthday party tonight in Washington. <laughs> wow. I'm so happy to be able to uh, see him because I will guarantee you he will talk tonight and he will give us pearls of wisdom um, on his hundredth birthday and we'll all benefit from it. Well, we will benefit from having you here, Master Hudson. Yeah. And, you know, you have a particularly distinguished career, and it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to have this conversation with you. Also, you bring a, a really kind of, if not unique, a very special background because you have the NATO background, the diplomacy, but you've also served 
in the Congress, you've served in the executive office, and you really have a very holistic view of the U.S. government uh, and as well as, as foreign policy. So I'd like to start off with a sort of, well, mind game's probably not the right word, but a projection. And I, you, the war in Ukraine can end in all kinds of ways, but certainly one possibility is that it grinds on and a year or so from now we're in a, some kind of frozen conflict where maybe the Ukrainians have done better but they haven't won, the Russians haven't quit. As you look out on sort of a hypothetical, a year from now if the war is still going on, what is that, what's the world as you see it for, the, where is NATO at that point? Where is the, as we're entering deeply into a political election campaign at the same time, where is Europe? And I sort of ask you to take a broad look at what that would mean if we're just grinding along a year from now. Ron, it is so important that all of us understand that this is not um, a far off civil dispute in a country that doesn't matter. This is totally a part of our security for the United States and the future of our security going forward. Because Russia going into Ukraine, of course, we're all horrified. I mean, it's horrific what is going on. These are innocent people, but they are a people who have shown so much courage and stamina and spirit to protect their country. And of course we need to support them from a human level. But it is in our security interest that we stick through this so that Ukraine wins because not only is Russia gauging how long Europe, NATO, America will stay focused on this because we have shown in the past that we have sanctioned, said, well, you know, after Crimea, after Georgia, we've kind of said, well, you know, it's really um, not our deal. And so we've kind of walked away and lost interest. We can't lose interest. We can't walk away. We've got to stick with it. And that's because if we don't, then Putin, of course, will see other options that he will go into. He'll start with the non-NATO countries in the East that are easy, uh, Belarus, Moldova, uh, but then it'll be NATO next. If we don't stand up now, that's what will happen with Russia. But more important is who else is watching? All of the adversaries that have been wanting to confront America are going to say, this is our time. Starting with President Xi of China and then on to possibly North Korea or Iran. Who knows where it would go from there. But what's important is that we've got to stick with it. And when you talk about a stalemate and a long time, uh, it's going to get harder, of course. But we must stick with it so that she doesn't get the idea that, well, Taiwan's going to be easy now, if ever we're going to do it, this is the time. And what we have to do to deter both Russia and China, which are the immediate issues, we've got to show the strength and unity of NATO and our partners <coughs> Uh, that are like-minded. So NATO is 31 countries that are allies that have pledged our treasure and our lives. If any of us are attacked, we're all attacked. But we have 40 partners. We have 40 formal partners in NATO. So the Asia Pacific partners that are very important have now been brought into NATO summits 
and we are doing more now. NATO has just opened an office in Japan, for instance, because we're going to be doing more coordination as we are uh, taking the position that NATO is now to protect every risk that any of our countries in NATO will face because eventually we would get involved. So if we're going to protect against all of the threats, we've got to be looking at where the threats are. And NATO has, in their strategic review, um, designated China as a potential adversary. Now, we're going to work to deter that adversarial position, and that is going to be in our security interest. So one of the ways that we will deter is to assure that we stay unified, because if, if we stay unified, we are the largest economies of the world, as well as a security umbrella because we are sharing all of our security assets. So to keep that strength is going to be important for Russia, but it's also going to be looking forward to China because the way, the best way that we can deter is to make it too expensive for Russia to continue to lose their hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers that are out there. I mean, they're not even soldiers anymore. They're uh, recruits that have not even been trained. They're, I mean, it's, um, it's disgusting what President Putin is doing to his own people, but also, of course, to uh, be able to stand up to China uh, and show that it would be too expensive uh, for China to also continue to violate the rules-based order. So the, a long way to say that time is not on our side with Ukraine because Russia does have more capability to last. They're a much larger uh, military. They're a much larger autocratic government. And what we've got to do is stick with it. And if we're in a stalemate, um, it's going to get harder and harder. So what, what I hope will be the next step is to help Ukraine win, not go into a stalemate, but to win. And I think we've done uh, a good job of helping Ukraine as it has gone forward, now I think is the time to help them win this so that there is not your scenario. You know, as, as you look at this, thinking about the threats that you mentioned, possible threats into Europe if Putin wins, possible threats from China if they miscalculate our resolve, those threats would all involve America in combat. In Ukraine, we have the Ukrainians doing the fighting. We're adding money, but we're not shedding American blood while we are really dealing with our own security. And yet that seems to be a very hard message for many people to, to understand. That if you get it wrong here, you know, the basic notion of deterrence is we don't have to fight. They're doing it. Uh, if you get it wrong, we do get to fight. Uh, and yet, that seems to be a very difficult message to get across in our own politics. And I wanted to take the advantage of your having this broad background that's not just the foreign part of our politics. Where do you see this issue going in our domestic politics a year from now as we are moving into a presidential election? Is this doubt seed gonna uh, reoccur? I mean, this is, it's not a unique thing in American politics. People forget that we only sustained the draft in 1941 by one vote uh, when people, there was a strong view that we shouldn't be involved in that European conflict. Uh, and uh, one vote less, and we wouldn't have had an army to go into World War II. So we've got this 
theme again. Um, how does one deal with this? Well, I think your point is another one to make, and that is uh, Ukraine has not asked for American troops on the ground, and we have not, I mean, I think President Biden was right to say right up from the beginning, there will not be American troops on the ground. And that is an important difference, and it's part of the whole deterrence of winning in Ukraine so that we won't have to fight in a bigger theater. So I, I, I think that's a point that uh, will be made as we are going forward. But you know, I think what you're kind of indicating is that there are beginning to be little, uh, not even sometimes little, but uh, murmurs on the sidelines that, well, this is a territorial uh, dispute in Europe. Uh, but uh, I was very heartened by uh, Kevin McCarthy putting that to bed right away last week when he was asked by a Russian uh, press person, uh, well, we understand that you are not for continuing to arm Ukraine uh, in, in this fight that doesn't affect America. And Kevin McCarthy came right back and he said, you are wrong. I absolutely support Ukraine. We will support Ukraine. There is no question about it. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he was very firm with that Russian. And I thought that sort of settled out what some had thought might be uh, some kind of a, a movement in the House of Representatives. There is no movement in the House of Representatives. There is bipartisan support, total support, of the leaders, bipartisan, and the mainstream members of both sides of the aisle in the House and Senate, and I think um, they understand the consequences. They're seeing exactly what we've been talking about. The security of America uh, is at stake in our sticking with Ukraine so that we show the real threats to American security that we will not back down. You know, one of the things that comes with our support, comes with the war, comes with European support, but that doesn't quite get addressed frontally often is the economic consequences. Uh, it's not just in our budget, but it's also in other key priorities like climate change, for instance. Uh, can you, you know, you're dealing with the whole consequences for Europe of cutting off of Russian uh, oil and gas production. So, do you, so far the economies, the countries have been remarkably resilient in being willing to bear the economic cost, but there will be, you know, there, there will be tensions between things like climate objectives and the money that's needed for energy conversion versus supporting the war and doing without uh, Russian fuel, for instance. As you look at the European picture, particularly, not to mention our own uh, budgetary discussions of the moment, uh, how do you feel about our ability to continue uh, making those trade-offs and holding firm, the, to the extent that one can speculate about something that uh, explosive with that many partners? Well, here I'm going to say something uh, about the whole energy issue, which I think we need to reassess. Um, first of all, the Europeans have been um, able to get through this past winter um, with the uh, limited resources that uh, they have by cutting off Russia. Now, there's no question that um, the Nord Stream 2 should never have happened. It should never have been accepted by Germany. And um, I'm sorry that it took an invasion for uh, Germany to realize that it was time to uh, cut that off. But then Germany has also closed their nuclear power plants and reopened coal. So uh, is that? Yeah, yeah that, that um, is a 
I mean, talking about an inter climate. An interesting decision. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting. So, what I think we need to also do, talking about the economy, and the first thing we should do is secure America and secure America's energy. And right now, we are at the all time low point of our own strategic uh, petroleum reserve. I think that is. Uh, something that should be addressed right away. And secondly, I think we have been cutting back. The president uh, has, has cut off uh, our pipeline, uh, the Keystone XL, uh, which I think we should try to reopen because we need to produce oil and natural gas so that we can export to our allies so that they will have alternative energy and I think we ought to be doing that right away. Um, and secondly, on the climate issue, uh, we produce natural gas cleaner than any other country that we are now trying to import uh, uh, petroleum products from. Um, and we should rethink. All of us want to go to the transition into renewable energy, clean energy. We do. But it isn't going to be instant, and now we have a crisis in which we need to respond. So we need to respond by making America completely energy independent. That's part of our security and should be part of our security uh, priority. Secondly, we should uh, produce, continue to research and produce for the uh, renewables and the the climate uh, uh, production that we all want. But in the meantime, we need to make sure that we are able to export to Europe rather than coal and what that's doing for our climate uh, to be able to have clean natural gas. And also, you know, I think we, we need to rethink, and this is going a little bit off, but we need to rethink nuclear. Uh, for clean energy, we all agree that nuclear is totally clean, and hydrogen is, is now coming up in research. Uh, and those are things that we can do, and we have learned how to do safely, um, and the French have certainly shown that nuclear energy can be very uh, inexpensive and productive and, um, and also environmentally safe. So I think we've got to look at energy as part of our security dialogue and becoming American uh, independent in energy as we are working more and more toward the renewables and, and um, getting more and more uh, climate uh, uh, equ equitable. Um, but we also need to help our allies not produce more climate uh, pollution by shutting off coal plants, and that includes China as well as uh, what Germany's doing and, and countries that don't want to do it but are doing it. So from an economic standpoint, I think, number one, we need energy independence, but number two, um, I think we need to make sure that we are putting everything into security that has to be done proactively and not reactively. Thank you. Tempting as it is to ask you another question because I'm really enjoying this, I think we ought to give the audience a chance for maybe one or two questions sure. uh, if we can. But I would ask that questions be short. Uh, and, and maybe and, the answer shorter. And, well, <laughs> you you With are in an unusual position. You are said. in an unusual position <laughs> for a speaker that you have more motivation to be short than most because you got to get on a plane. So. Uh, who would like a question here? There, there, there's one, sir, there's one here. Well, let me, do, do, well, I, I can really? speak without the, without the microphone. Do we, is that okay for recording, David? Do, we don't, right. okay, go ahead. Um, so my name is Colin Nelson. I thank you very much for being here. Um, the, the main part of your, of your discussion has been towards the NATO aspect, obviously, and the military side of it. However, I think there is one elephant in the room which affects security, which is BRICS. So, you know, there seems to be, to me, to be a movement to undermine the overarching status of the US dollar. 
uh, by Brazil and Russia and, and the other companies, uh, countries involved in BRICS to basically undermine the sanctions issues which are uh, attained by the US government. And I just wonder if you have any comment in the overall economic aspect of <coughs> the strengthening of a non-NATO, which is a military sort of organization, in the economic area, such as BRICS. Thank you. In, um, in three minutes or less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's uh, such an interesting, uh, the, the economic point uh, that you were bringing out as well. Uh, it's very important, of course, that we keep the dollar as the uh, universal global uh, uh, currency. And I think uh, China is, of course, trying to uh, change that with some of their efforts in the Middle East uh, to uh, use the yuan. Um, and, you know, even it's interesting, uh, Russia is uh, resisting using the Indian currency for their trade, because as we know, India is uh, continuing to buy Russian oil, and Russia wants uh, to use uh, the Russian currency. So uh, all of that, I think, is playing out, but I, I think the strength of the American dollar must be watched and make sure that we keep it uh, as the maintaining uh, currency of the world. Um, and I, I think that certainly is part of this whole overall picture. And um, in, um, in the NATO context, I think um, the, the euro and the dollar are certainly uh, the, the key um, trading units, but I think I think the dollar is going to be uh, it's going to be very important that we protect the strength of the dollar and of course uh, the whole budget issue that that'll bring up uh, the budget issue and I hope that the president will sit down with Congress uh, and uh, negotiate uh, together on raising the debt ceiling so that that currency is protected. It's a very interesting question. It goes into a whole other dimension that we're not going to get yeah. into today, <laughs> right. but that is our tendency to use the strength of the dollar as part of sanctions with our control of the financing system. Mm -hmm. And Americans like sanctions. They're easy to slap on, a little hard to get off sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and they haven't been sort effective of our, at all. They haven't been yeah. effective in many cases, but yeah. they're our default go-to you know, pe penalty. But we are building up a certain amount of resentment as we use the SWIFT system and the dollar centrality mm -hmm. to impose sanctions against many countries. Uh, there's something to be watched there that that resentment doesn't build to a point of beginning to implement alternative systems, but we won't do that today. So I think we've got time for one more question. Let's see, do we have any ladies in the audience? We got, why are the men dominating everything? Well, this gentleman here, I think, had, a fir had the first, or no, we got a lady, I want a lady. <laughs> we want a little equality of representation here. Thank you, Stephanie Rudd. Can you comment on President Xi's attempt to become a mediator in the Ukraine crisis? It's very, Mm -hmm. um, could, could everybody hear the question? No, no. Uh, the question was about China's uh, desire to become a mediator. Mm -hmm. Well, I think China, for the first time in our uh, memory, uh, is this year going out and making uh, a deal in Saudi Arabia with Iran and be, be trying to uh, show that they are now uh, another great power in the world. Um, and I think the effort uh, with Ukraine, um, you, you, have to, you have to always say, as the diplomatic community will, well, look, I mean, let's just let it play out. Let's, uh, if it can work, great. But the issue on uh, mediating in Ukraine, where she is clearly on the Russian side, 
um, has to be taken with uh, that knowledge. And of course, uh, when people talk about a ceasefire, they say, well, oh, let's have a ceasefire. Well, where will the lines be drawn when you start a negotiation? That's the key. So do you want she at the table when the lines are drawn uh, for a negotiation? Well, of course not. I mean, you, you have to, you know, you never want to say she is not going to uh, play it fair, but open it all, open it up, see what happens, take it as it comes, and anything that we can do that would come out with the Ukraine win that they are satisfied with and they have to make that choice, uh, we should be open, open the doors and see what happens. You don't want to assume that she will take the Russian position, but, you know, it's likely, but, you know, maybe we will have um, an ability to work through this with she. You know, it'd be great if we could work in a way that would try to bring China into the rules-based order. That's what we tried to do when we put them in the WTO. Uh, we said, okay, that'll give us a chance to have leverage. And what did they do? They never came into the rules-based order. So um, if this is the time where they're going to make a pivot, let's give them a chance to do it. As yeah. Reagan, I'll just end with Reagan saying, trust but verify. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very true. And and very important to separate the issue of negotiation from the the reflexive desire for ceasefire. You know, how often do you hear people say, well, we need a ceasefire so we can have negotiations? Yeah. And you know what a ceasefire does is it takes the pressure off at least one party to agree to anything. And you look around the world, you think, where do you have real, you know, these frozen ceasefires, Cyprus, Lebanon, Korea, and it, there's no evidence out there that ceasefires actually help negotiations, but we're fascinated. But we can't do that one either. And I have to apologize to others who had questions, but I will be apologizing to you a whole lot more if you missed your plane. Yeah. Uh, and so I think I've got the bring us to a close and thank you so much for doing this and please everybody uh, good uh, thank you let me just let me say as I leave that I wish I could stay you are going to have the best panel of people who know these issues and you can ask the hard question to them I hope you will um, and I thank all of you for uh, for coming and I'm so glad to be a part of this, and I hope that I hope we will not be back next year on the same subject. I hope we'll be able to come back next year and talk about what the victory was like. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You thank were great. You. No. You helped so much. Thank you, Kay. And we're now going to form. We're going to form a panel for the hard questions and the the hard answers in discussion, uh, with General Lute, with Ambassador Taylor, and with our own Baker Institute, Ken Medlock, the director of our Center for Energy Studies. We have given a great deal of study here at the institute over the past year plus on the energy implications of the termination of Russian natural gas supply with particular attention to Germany, to modeling Germany energy needs, uh, to looking at demand rationing as it's already occurred in Germany and what it will be in this winter of 23-24 to come with the framework that rationing will set for sustained support for Ukraine, something which uh, Kay as well as Ron alluded to in their discussion and the French also are going to be very, very focused on what the coming uh, winter will mean for them. So Ron, back over to you. We're getting uh, Ken mic'd up right now, but I think we can move the, the panel that. to chairs. Pardon? You're doing the panel, right? Well, Ken will be joining us up here, but I'll, I'll be staying, but you're absolutely. Come on up.
Don't want, want you to go over and sit. Bookend. Sit there in the middle. I'll sit on this one. Right now, the broad assumption in the U.S. administration, intelligence community, it is fair to say, having just had Bill Burns, the CIA director here, discussing this, that Putin isn't ready for any serious discussion at this point. He still believes that if he can't win, and he can't, an over classic military victory, he can attrit the international community and Ukraine to a place where they accept a resolution which will be on his terms, not on international terms or Ukrainian terms. Zelensky is in a posture right now of pressing for total victory, or victory as he would define it. So I'm gonna ask you first, Doug, and then I'll follow Bill with you. How do you move forward to a position where you don't have a Putin-defined victory as the outcome? What has to be done? Well, thanks for that, and, and to the center and the academy for hosting uh, and bring, bringing us all together here in Houston. You know, I, I take exception, frankly, to the question, right? Because the reality about war is that it is unpredictable. So here we sit on a beautiful Monday morning trying to predict an outcome uh, in a phenomenon that defies prediction. So you won't hear from me um, a, a, a very clear, concise view of where we'll be a year from now or how this will actually end because once you cross the Rubicon, once you cross, in this case, um, the border with Ukraine with an armed invasion, it is unpredictable. So it's just as likely that we're going to be here next year talking about this and it'll be stalemated as it is that, the, for example, an alternative, the Ukrainians counterattack, which everybody's sort of waiting for, right? And the Russian army collapses. We simply don't know. And that's why, before we get into something like this, we ought to accept the fact that war is unpredictable. And, and frankly, that should ring pretty true to Americans, given our experience of the last 20 years, right? We can get into something, but how it ends is really not up to us. I, I'd like to ask, or, or to offer a sort of a, a strategic context here. You know, in my 40 years in the US government, um, I can count three times when I thought I was close to history, experiencing history, and that the history I was experiencing had long, deep repercussions, ramifications, aftershocks. The first one, here we are at the Baker Center, right, was 89 to 91, right? I think that was a strategic, historic pivot point. Uh, and really the first one, I was a young Army major at the time, you know, you're so close to history, you don't appreciate it, you know, until several years of perspective. But with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, and then the breakup of the Soviet Union, 89 to 91, uh, I think that was a historic pivot point, which frankly, we're still living with. I mean, much of what motivates Putin today uh, comes from that pivot point. The second one for me was 9-11. I mean, everybody here has his or her story about where you were on 9-11. That was a historic pivot point. And for 20 years, at least 20 years, and I think frankly still today, we're living with the aftershocks of 9-11. I mean, we're unless you have TSA pre-check, you're still taking your shoes off at the airport, unless, right? Unless you're 75. Unless you're, <laughs> that's as good. You don't have to take your shoes off. Uh, great, great, so this, we can all aspire to this, right? <laughs> I'm there. But, but, but again, so it's a point in history where we all remember where we were that day, but we didn't really know on September 12th what all the aftershocks would be, right? And we're still experiencing those. I think February 24th last year, 
2022 is the third such pivot point in my professional lifetime. And here we are one year, 15 months after the Russian invasion, and we're still trying to figure out and predict what the aftershocks are going to be. Um, I think it's largely unpredictable, but it will be wide ranging and it will have aftershocks. It'll have implications that simply nobody can imagine right now. Uh, so it's good that we're doing this, but my guess is we will be back here next year uh, thinking again about and realizing that, wow, we didn't think of that, but that's a direct repercussion, implication of the invasion last year. So Let's, that's not had nothing to do with your question, but I was gonna, I was gonna say that anyway. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> because I think it's the right. I think it is a good question, and but I also think Doug's right. Um, um, we don't know. Ne nobody can say um, the answer to that question. However, uh, I will go. I'll be a little more specific than, than Doug. That is, um, there are two scenarios, and Doug hinted at you explicitly talked about both. Um, uh, one scenario um, is this counteroffensive that the Ukrainians have been mounting, preparing for months, um, uh, succeeds. The best, we talked about this last night, the best case, the best case um, uh, of this counteroffensive succeeding is uh, that um, these new units that the, uh, that the Ukrainians are putting together with NATO training and NATO tanks, you know, with leopard tanks, um, break through the Russian lines. And then, then they push through, the Ukrainians push through more units uh, into the Russian rear, into the occupied territories that the Russians now occupy, uh, causing havoc back there and, you know, attacking headquarters and, and with long range weapons and long range artillery, uh, attack uh, fuel bases and uh, ammo dumps and this kind of thing and cause panic, and cause panic in the Russian army. Um, that's the best case, and it could happen. It could happen. Um, a little bit, you know, another version of that first, sh so this is the short scenario. There's a long scenario and a short. This is the short scenario where on the, at the breakthrough, um, the best case is the, the uh, Russians panic, it's a rout, and the Ukrainians do exactly what Zelensky has said, push the Russians all the way out of the country. We can talk about Crimea, <clears throat> but that's but then there's a shorter version. There, there's you know they don't quite get all the way out. You know there is some resistance, and the Russians don't crack, um, and they and they push back, and maybe the counterattack. But the Ukrainians take more territory, take back more territory, um, and what either of those best cases, we let short scenarios do, is give us, um, give the Ukrainians, give the Europeans the the confidence that the Ukrainians can indeed uh, succeed. That's one scenario. There's another scenario, and this is the one that we kind of talked about. This is the one that Ron Newman asked uh, the senator about, uh, which is the long scenario, where neither side can break through. Neither side can, neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians can break through, the, uh, and it's a stalemate, um, and it goes on. Uh, and then the question you know, Ron asked, okay, you know, ceasefires, and, you know, which I totally agree with the last comment, that is, you know, Zelensky's not ready for a ceasefire. He's, he's convinced, he's absolutely convinced he's gonna push the Russians out. Um, we've already talked about Putin's view. Putin, Putin doesn't think he's uh, losing. He's not gonna stop for a ceasefire. So that, that's not gonna happen. But the long scenario is this long grind somehow. And maybe it is Korea. Um, maybe it is a, uh, some kind of division um, uh, without, without maybe a line. You know, we're going to talk about kind of NATO and NATO uh, assurances or guarantees um, to Ukraine. Um, for that, you do need a line. So it's, it's a complicated one. But in the end, I will, I will say um, that, uh, uh, that, that the Ukrainians will come out of this in either the short scenario or the long scenario, and we'll, we'll talk about this. I'm going to ask you both a very pointed question. <clears throat> if the U.S. and its allies do not wish for this to be a long war with a long solution or a frozen conflict, Korea in quotes, style ending, what is needed now? 
to change all of this. What needs to be done in terms of convincing Putin that the pain is too great for Russia, in Russia, for the military? I think the answer is, uh, the short, I'll give a short one, Doug, you give a, <coughs> a more considered one, I'm, I'm sure. The short answer is we need now, today, in the next two weeks, next month, to provide the Ukrainians what they need to, to break through and to succeed. And, and we can do that. We can do that. It's not, we don't, the F-16s, we talk a lot about the aircraft. Uh, that, that's important. The aircraft is important. Not going to help this summer. What we're talking about now is this counteroffensive, this summer, next three months, um, and it's not going to be aircraft. Um, it's going to be long-range artillery, um, long, these long-range precision-guided rockets. These are eight TACMs that the Army talks about. Um, and they go 300 kilometers, and right now the, the Ukrainians don't have those. They can go, I don't know, what, 150 kilometers, um, and they need to go deep. Um, we can do that. We could do that tomorrow. We could do that tomorrow. The other thing that they need, and then it's to Doug, is <coughs> drones. More drones. And these Reapers, <laughs> these Reaper drones, um, um, can do all kinds of things, including go deep into uh, Russian-held territory with weapons. Those two things can be done over and, the next few And months. Doug, before you respond, I'm going to seize on <coughs> your last point, Bill, and talk about where we've been. And the we here is not just the US, it's many of our key NATO partners. The fear of if we give Ukraine this, it'll push Putin over a red line. If it goes to the Crimea, the campaign, it will push Putin <coughs> over a red line and the specter looming of nuclear weapon use. Now, Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, made an extraordinary, on the record, in testimony remark last week in which she said, and this is a unique statement since this conflict began, that the U.S. intelligence community assesses the risk of nuclear weapons use here as exceedingly unlikely. What does that mean about red lines, escalation? Doug, where do we go and what are the risks in going there? Well, the first place we should go is to design a strategy. Okay, and, and I frankly don't, I can't, cons I don't detect one, okay? And in classic military terms, a strategy is the connection, the alignment of ends, ways, and means, right? So what it is you want to accomplish with how it is you're gonna go about it, and then finally assembling the resources required. And right now, Zelensky obviously has maximalist goals. His ends are all of Ukrainian territory. We seem to be mimicking that maximalist approach but when you get down the strategic logic to resources, we've constrained ourselves. So we have, in military terms, a strategic disconnect right now. So what we say we want to accomplish, we're not, uh, we're not assembling the resources required to do it. But we can. But, but we could, right? We could. <clears throat> uh, and every time in history that you endure one of these strategic disconnects, it doesn't end well, okay? It doesn't end well. You don't end up accomplishing what you set out to accomplish. So one of the ways we could do this, we, we either have to scale back what we say we're gonna try to accomplish, so uh, decrease or restrict our ends, our goals, or we need to scale up, yep. as Bill suggested, our resources. Um, there, and, and in the scaling up of resources, there is this hazard, or at least this perceived hazard, that we will cross some sort of Putin imaginary red line. Well, you know, the short history of the last 15 months is that we've crossed all kinds of red lines that Putin has set out that said, you know, if you do this, if you do this, it was, you know, high-end air defense system, it was tanks, uh, it was, and, and so forth, right? Um, it was at one time the 90-kilometer missiles, MLRS, another terrible Army acronym, right? And he said, don't provide that. Well, we've provided it. Um, and each time, We've done it in a very measured way, and this is what so frustrates me as a armchair strategist, I suppose, um, as though we can, we can precisely calibrate just how much we're going to provide. In fact, the White House has even, you know, sort of set itself on an every two week program with a new announcement, you know, another 100 million here, another 150 there, as though somehow we can, we can be in charge of this calibrated, 
incremental approach to just stay short of a perceived red line. And frankly, I don't think, that's, I don't think the history of warfare supports that kind of approach. Um, once you cross into this, you have to align ends, ways, and means, and you have to be willing to take some risk. I, I assess, I, I mean, I hadn't heard Avril Haines, um, the director of national intelligence, forecast, but I don't think Putin uh, intends to use nuclear weapons. He intends to talk about it. He intends to threaten it, but I don't think he intends to use it. And it really doesn't have a lot to do with us. I think he won't use nuclear weapons because that would, um, that would compromise his partnership with Xi, who uh, is essentially the only meaningful support that Vladimir Putin has. It would completely isolate um, uh, Russia from the international community, and I think it would break ties um, significantly with uh, President Xi of China. So if there's a deterrence equation here, <laughs> I think Putin's probably deterred because of his reliance on China for uh, political and economic support. And a quick question for General Lute. General Milley famously spoke some months ago about the impact upon U.S. planning, the war plans, of the continued draw on U.S. weaponry. Can we provide what is necessary to accomplish what you all are talking about without significantly, as opposed to technically, derogating our ability to conduct other campaigns should they arise? Yeah, look, there's no question that the level of support the quantity of some of these very sophisticated weapons that we've already given to Ukraine, and the consideration of giving even more sophisticated weapons, like this longer range missile that Bill, uh, Bill suggested, has an impact on our stocks. So these are not limitless stocks. Uh, but you know, we're only in one fight right now. So the competition between winning in Ukraine and preserving some for some future conflict, to me, makes little sense. Look, the, the, the only true threat in classic terms on the table right now is Vladimir Putin. China's a potential, perceived, possible, um, but there's all, we're only in one fight right now. And it seems to me that once you get into a fight like that and you take the decision that we're going to provide the kinds of support we've provided, then you're, we're in. We're, we're committed. And that means that if we have to draw down U.S. stocks, we should draw them down. And then we should take reasonable steps to replenish those stocks. But that means getting into the industrial base. And that's going to be expensive. And it's going to take some time. But this is not a risk-free environment. And it seems to me a reasonable risk to draw down our stocks if it gives the Ukrainians a chance to actually win. Uh, one more question for both of you before we turn to Ken and the issue of the energy impact of all of this. My question is, we. We, the international community, the coalition, and Putin, got it hugely wrong on the eve of this war. We, all of us, made two deeply flawed assessments. One was that Ukraine didn't have the capacity to resist the Russians for more than three to five weeks. That was a uniform judgment on the part of every intelligence community involved in looking at this picture, including the Russian. Second judgment deeply flawed was that the Russian military wasn't perhaps NATO quality, but it was good enough. It was disastrously not good enough. Are we running the risk of making a similar flawed default judgment now that, first, Russia cannot, through any possible mobilization or application of assets, win in a military sense, but more importantly, that Ukraine cannot break through. Bill, you made, and Doug, you made the assertion that we don't know this and we shouldn't be making assumptions to the contrary, but I wonder if there is an overhang here that assumes Korea is the outcome and our planning should be directed towards that even if we don't speak that word out loud. And what the consequences of such an overlying assumption would be. So Doug, <coughs> Doug will have, uh, um, Again, better thoughts on this than I, but um, David, um, it seems to me that, uh, yeah, all the intelligence got it wrong on those two things. You're exactly right. Um, we all thought that uh, <coughs> the Russian army was probably the second best in the world. It turns out it's the second best in Ukraine. Um, <laughs> um, 
and um, and but and Bill Burns did get it right on were they going to invade. A lot of people didn't agree with that. Um, so I, I visited came just before the invasion. Um, uh, Bill Burns had been there, you know, a couple of weeks before, and he had briefed President Zelensky. He briefed. Uh, General Zelensky, he briefed the uh, Ukrainians very well, and, he, and Bill Burns told him, you know, it looks like they're going to invade. Um, and I was talking to Zelensky w three weeks, it was the end of January of yep. 2022, um, and he did not want to believe it. Sure. Did not want to believe it. He was taking some steps, though, to prepare for that. They were doing some dispersals, and they were doing, he told us, uh, I was there with Ben Hodges, uh, uh, he told Ben Hodges and myself that, um, that he, Zelensky, was the next day going to expand his army and going to double the pay. Um, he was taking steps to make it strong, to, to be more. But he didn't believe that that, uh, that, they, that the Russians would really, that Putin would actually pull that trigger. Bill Burns got that right, so, so that was certainly right. But look at what the, uh, uh, what the two sides, we were talking about the overhang, David. Um, the intelligence, act, our intelligence, you know, got some things right, got some things wrong. We learned some things. One of the things we know now is that the Ukrainians um, are in better shape than they've ever been. They are approaching the, the, the peak, <laughs> peak Ukraine, um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of their cap military capabilities. You know, nine, ten, eleven new armored brigades, armed, armed and equipped and trained by NATO. Uh, again, Doug can talk about uh, about this, uh, but they're they're prepared, and their <coughs> leadership is again we don't we don't need intelligence to tell us this. Their leadership, civilian and military, is incredible. I mean, we've talked about Zelensky, um, but Zeluzhny, um is a very good general. He understands military art, and Z Zelensky has kept Zeluzhny, the the essentially the general Milley of uh, of Ukraine. Um, on board for 15 months. Now, and one last thing on the Ukraine side, Ukrainian morale is still very high. Both, both the civilians we heard about uh, last night, but also uh, in particular the military. I've got good friends in the, military, in the Ukrainian military, and I talk to them weekly. Um, the morale is very high. On the, on the Russia side, just real lastly on the, on the intelligence, what we know is the Russians are probably right now at a nadir. They're probably at the bottom. They're probably least prepared to defend themselves right now. You, but you're right. They've got 140 million Russians to draft. Half, they only go men, but so they got 70 million Russians that they can draft, um, but that takes time. Right now, the Russians are at a, at a low point. Their leadership is terrible. Their leadership is terrible. They're fragmented. They got this guy, Prigozhin, this Wagner guy, who is, who is uh, out of control. A murderous, Chef. predatory thug. Like Putin. Sense. Like Putin. They're both murderous, predatory thugs. Um, but, um, but, but Putin is kind of playing one, Prigozhin, one murderous thug, against his, his uh, defense minister uh, and his chief of staff. So, and he's had three commanders of this effort in the past in the past year. So I mean, every three months he changes because they can't get anything done. So the leadership is terrible. The morale is terrible. You, you, the Russians don't know why they're there. The Russians, uh, when they they didn't, even, they weren't even told that they were going to invade. They were told this could be a, a an exercise. Um, some showed up in Ukraine and wrote their mothers that, uh, uh, "Mom, I'm actually in Ukraine." Um, so and the morale. Why are they fighting? They don't know. Why are the Ukrainians fighting? Because it's, it's existential, because they're fighting for their communities, for their homes, for their, for their country. If they lose, there's no Ukraine. So, so on that comparison, on that kind of analysis, intelligence, um, Ukrainians are, are in good shape and the Russians are in bad shape right now. Doug? Yeah, just a couple thoughts on this. You know, we, our intelligence group has a pretty uneven track record in terms of predictions. Okay. One could, say. <laughs> one could say. I mean, you can let your imagination run wild here, right? But most of the time when we get it wrong, in my observation, it's because we focused on, we have focused on the tangibles, the quantifiable aspects of military capability. So tanks, ships, planes, numbers of troops. This all sounds familiar from the pre-invasion days, right? 
there were 150,000 Russians amassed on the Ukrainian border. They're going to invade. There are 170,000. They're really going to invade, right? And while we focus on the quantitative factors, we tend to discount or have trouble assessing the qualitative factors, which are the ones that Bill's been talking about. So leadership, morale, unit cohesion, discipline, and so forth, right? And if you go back into history, there's a long track record of quality beating quantity, right? And this, in short, is what we see in Ukraine today. We're seeing Ukrainian quality fighting for their own existence, their own nation, right? Beating the masses of Russian quantity. And over the last year, even the, quali even the quantitative disconnect, right, has begun to level out in Ukraine's favor. Partly because the Ukrainians have captured intact Russian equipment and brought it to this side of the ledger sheet, which is crazy, right? That's not standard. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so if there were, if this were a betting game and we were, you know, betting here, I'd have to bet on the qualitative factors, which are all in the favor of Ukraine. Now, I say that, and so, and it also seems like the right thing, right? That it should be that way. But it, I'll, I'll just close on this part with where I started, which is that you know, war is fundamentally unpredictable. So I think Bill's assessment that Ukraine is peaking and Russia is diving is about right. And that should give Ukraine and its allies and partners like us optimism. But we should have this nagging suspicion that um, this is really unpredictable. Okay. So, Ken, what has been the impact on the global energy market, sector, availability of energy, need to go to demand rationing in Germany, elsewhere in Europe? And how do you look, and this is not so much um, prediction as it is reliance upon certain known variables in availability of platforms, contracts, units for liquefaction, gasification. Where does Europe go? Are there factors that are going to make it tougher, easier, over the next year and a half to sustain, from an economic standpoint, energy standpoint, this fight or not? So I've been listening obviously to the conversation. I really liked the, the quantitative versus qualitative um, point. A very similar point actually holds in energy. Um, we've seen, and it's been very you know, widely reported in the press, uh, European natural gas inventories are at record levels. Um, a lot of that was driven by mandates at the end of last year to hit certain targets for gas in storage which turned out to be, um, quite frankly, one of the reasons price rose as rapidly as it did in the fall of last year in Europe, um, which then, of course, matriculates from natural gas directly into the electric power sector. Um, tremendous pressure on European economies because of high prices. Um, I think that is the element of the discussion where you get into the qualitative impacts that has been largely disregarded or underreported on, however you want to frame it. A um, couple of data points just to kind of pull this into perspective. Um, last year, it was, it was a, a recent McKinsey report, actually came out a week, a, a week and a half ago. Um, last year, uh, energy expenditures uh, as a fraction of gross domestic product in the EU 27 was in excess of 9%. So that's huge. For those of you who don't know what typical is, it's about 35 to, to 4%. That's acceptable sort of range. In the United States, we're sitting at around 3.7%. That's now. So when people talk about the ramifications for what's happened in Europe on economies and households, it is very different in Europe than it is in other places. So, so sometimes we like to talk about the global energy market, but I think we have to realize that the impacts are very specific. Um, now, why does 9% matter? Well, uh, this is going to go back to some research that I did over 20 years ago. Um, 
where I was looking at the implication of energy price increases on economic performance. And anytime you see the share of energy expenditures relative to GDP go up above four, approach five, and in excess of that percent, you actually see a major drag on economies. Industrial sectors tend to slow down. Households tend to have less disposable income, so they spend less on durable goods and non-durable goods and services. Um, this is really where Europe sits right now. So the resolve might be very strong now, and the quantity issues are not really the issue now. But as we go forward, if energy continues to be very expensive, and it will be, as a matter of fact, most projections put energy expenditures in Europe in excess of five up to six percent for the next few years. That is a massive weight on those economies. And you're already seeing some fracture points. So for example, BASF announcing that it's considering leaving Germany. This is a, this is a shockwave, right? I mean, this is something that will have utterly transformative impacts on the German economy because you're talking about its core, which is its industrial base. If it starts to leave the European Union because of the cost of energy, you will see fractures start to emerge. And that's where you, know, you get into the qualitative issues. How, what is the resolve? What do households feel? What is their support for certain courses of action? Um, at the end of the day, if, you're, if your resolve is fracturing as a result of your inability to afford heating and lighting your home, that's a different issue. Again, it's very uncertain, so I like that point. I mean, it's difficult to predict where this will go, but I think that's something that needs to be part of the discussion because it isn't, and, and, it's, and it's a little shocking. Um, this coming year, uh, as we roll through this winter, is going to be very interesting. One thing that I think a lot of people have kind of come to understand is one of the big saviors of Europe over the last winter was it wasn't cold. Right? As a matter of fact, January was the warmest January on record. So when you don't have cold weather, that means heating bands don't rise. That means you don't draw down natural gas inventories. That means you can exit the winter heating season with record inventory levels, which was really propelled by the massive influx of gas by mandate into inventory last fall. What's interesting about that is what fed that inventory level? It was actually Russian gas because pipeline imports from Russia into Europe were still happening at this time last year. It wasn't until the sanctions took, took, took hold, actually we saw the bombing of the Nord Stream facility, um, that those, those volumes diminished. And of course, the Europeans did a, a tremendous job of stepping up LNG imports. The US is the largest provider of LNG into the, into the European Union right now. Um, so US is, doing its part, if you will, in maintaining energy security. But what's remarkable is, is as you go through the rest of this year and you get into the next winter, if it is a normal winter or if it is a colder than normal winter, which often happens after a warmer than normal winter, believe it or not, then you actually run the risk of running out of gas. You've shut down nuclear power plants. You've reactivated lignite mines so that you can burn coal. Um, you're still rationing. You've got a tremendous reduction in industrial demand. As a matter of fact, there's a great resource um, that's available online. Uh, uh, it's on our website, but it's, it's more broadly reported by Bruegel. It's a, it's, a, it's a German data outfit where they actually show the largest industrial reductions in load or demand and where they've occurred, and it's a result of drops in output. So you see this in Germany, you see this in Italy, Basically, name a major a, a country in Europe with a major industrial center, and you will see a significant increase in industrial demand for natural gas and energy more generally. That's not sustainable. You cannot continue to do that and hope to drive economic growth and ultimately prosperity. It will it will begin to drive fractures, and that begs another question, which I would love to hear y'all's comments on. I'm not alone in this, but because I've got some colleagues that, that study energy markets, one of the things that, that we sort of saw and, and pontificated about, right, a lot of us, um, what was Putin's main goal here? Was it to actually take over Ukraine or was it to fracture Europe? And I think that's a reasonable question, particularly given now what's happening with energy and all the things I just stated. So I don't know if that's something that has been discussed, but it certainly raises the element of uncertainty. Well, let me just point out that this is Putin's long game, right? He may be losing his army in Ukraine, but he's betting on the long run. 
right? He's betting that these sort of economic factors in our democracies will fracture the support for Ukraine, and he'll be able to hang on. And by the way, the Russian people are sort of, they pride themselves in being able to sort of tolerate pain and so forth, right? This is the great, you know, the great war, uh, the great victory in 1945 and so forth, right? So this is his long game. Uh, and Putin would be very glad uh, to, uh, to recognize this data because it says, I've got a chance. This is his out. Uh, I, I'd be interested in Bill's take on this, but I think Putin's objective, to go to your question, um, was not really to occupy all of Ukraine. It was to deny Ukraine as a prosperous democratic model next door to Russia, which because of the cultural and demographic and even language commonality with Russia would suggest to the Russian people that if Ukraine can be democratic and prosperous right across the border next door, right, then what about us? And that would be an existential threat to Putin's regime. I'll, I'll have a comment on, but, on, on what, Putin and what he wanted, but Bill? Yeah, um, I think Doug's right. I think uh, he didn't, but Putin did not want to see a successful Ukraine on his border for the reasons that Doug just said. And um, I think he did want and does want um, to dominate Ukraine one way or the other. Um, he try, he's tried this a couple of different ways. He, he thought he could have control over Ukraine by controlling the Ukrainian president, this guy named Yanukovych, um, who was very pro-Russian Ukrainian president from 2010 to 2014, when he was run out of the country. Uh, he's now in Moscow. Um, so th that didn't work for Putin. It didn't work to have uh, that control. So he tried to uh, do this kind of, he invaded, he invaded uh, uh, Crimea and then Donbass, and he thought that by controlling Donbass and this Minsk agreement would give him the control of those two, Donetsk and Luhansk, those two oblasts, and with that control over Kyiv, he could dominate Ukraine. That didn't work. So, so then he said, I, I, I am going to control Ukraine. That is what I'm after. And so he invaded on the, on the 22nd, uh, 24th of February last year. Um, and it is a turning point. I totally agree with Doug uh, on that. Um, and, and that's his first, he, he wants to be a great Russian leader, like, like Peter the Great or Catherine the Great. Um, um, and, and in order to do that, he has to have control, control somehow um, of Ukraine. That's, that's what's, uh, I think that's what's driving him. I don't think it's, you know, if he can, if he can break up Europe, great, you know, but I think he, he wants to take over Ukraine. My, my own observations, both on, on Putin, who I have had to deal with on, on numerous occasions, but also the intelligence, and I can speak to the intelligence now because our community made that intelligence in, in extraordinary detail and quantity, uh, information of the most sensitive character, publicly available, as well as privately briefed to governments, to make clear to Putin we knew what was being planned in exquisite detail, and to deny him the ability to assert a pretext for the invasion. Now, in the end, that didn't succeed, but it was an exceptional effort without parallel um, in modern American history of releasing every day, every week, the most sensitive information. What did that information from mid-October of 2021 to the day of the invasion tell us? It was complete control of Ukraine. Every city, every institution, in 100% of Ukrainian territory. There were specific assigned tasks to each of the Russian security agencies to oust, secure, and then replace, first with Russian interim governors and officials, then with tame Ukrainians, the rule in the country. And would it remain a country? Well, on that one, there's no clarity. The suggestion would be the ultimate fate of Ukraine. Um, would be determined after control of the country had been taken. But Putin's other comments that preceded the invasion, have followed it, would suggest in his bitter critique of Vladimir Lenin, Lenin the fool, Lenin the bungler, who created out of Russia 
these artificial fake countries, the fake countries range from the Baltics, of course, through the stands to Ukraine and probably a good chunk of what is now Eastern Europe, that these are fake countries. They don't have any real existence. Lenin made a mistake, I think that was literally Putin's words, in setting this up. His job is to rectify this and to reestablish what really is Russia, which goes way beyond Ukraine. But it was total, 100% control of the state of Ukraine, fate of which to be determined subsequently. Now, Putin and his motivations, I'll give you a, not just my, but, but other senior Russian officials, highly personalized assessment. This is a man who bears a phenomenal grudge against the world. It isn't the US, it isn't NATO, it's East, West, North, and South. The world participated in the fall of his world when the Soviet Union dissolved. And then the world danced on the ruins, deliberately humiliated the new Russian Federation, collapsed the ruble as an act of craft and intent to further humiliate Russia. And by God, he is going to pay all of us back. We will never again be in a position of humiliating Russia. Now, this is also good for him and the oligarchs. But there's beyond an, a tactical political motivation it is intensely personal. He despises the world, and he is going to teach the world its lesson. He will deliver our comeuppance at any price to Russia over any amount of time necessary. And so far, he's failing. So far, he is failing. He has unified NATO. He has expanded NATO. Uh, he has unified Ukraine. So I was, as you mentioned, I, I was in Ukraine twice. I was there in 2006, 2009, when there was a real debate about uh, which direction Ukraine should go. Should it go towards Russia or should it go towards Europe? Real debate. I mean, it was a, it's, a democ it's a messy democracy, but they had democratic debates and the second largest political party unabashedly un uh, said we should go toward Russia. We, we should be. It's, it's amazing. But, uh, when he invaded in 2014, and then when he invaded in tw last year in 2022, he united Ukraine like never before. They are 92%, 95% in support of not only their president, but of no negotiations with the Russians. They hate the Russians. And he has alienated uh, uh, a whole lot of people around the world. Uh, so I, I think he, and he's hammering his own economy. He's destroying his military. So he is failing in that, uh, in that kind of personal revenge, uh, almost irrational, almost irrational. He's not, I don't say he is irrational, but he's obsessed uh, with what you, what you said, what you said. There. You know, for, for individuals, for us, right? Humiliation, public humiliation, or perceived public humiliation is probably one of the deepest human emotions, right? And I think that's the sort of strategic chip he's got on his shoulder. But I also think, David, your comments suggest what this is all about for Americans, right? So do we want a world in which we have to live and we have to trade uh, and we have to interrelate, right? Built on empire where a Vladimir Putin can invade because of his humiliation or whatever, right? A weaker, a perceived weaker neighbor, which turns out maybe that was bad perception, but a neighbor, right? And get away with it, right? And if, by the way, if he does get away with it, there are probably 20 or 30 other cases around the globe of this sort of model where a strong, a strong state has a territorial dispute with a neighboring state. Think China and India, for example, in the Himalayas, mm -hmm. or China and Taiwan, or you know, and so forth, right? And if it's proven here that this can work and you can outlast the West and that imperialism can return to the world scene after the 20th century when we fought repeatedly to defeat imperialism, right? This is, a, this is an attempt by Putin to reinvigorate, to regenerate imperialism as a model. So both of you, is this about the whole campaign, the global mobilization, 
about, as it is sometimes described, a war for democracy? Or is it about structures of global order being fundamentally changed? Yes, I think the, the, I, yes, I think the administration frankly made a mistake up front in too narrowly defining this as good guys and bad guys, white hats and black hats, right? So democracy and autocracy. Because, you know, our democracy's got some work to do. You know, we're, maybe we're not, you know, maybe we're not the democracy on shining on the hilltop here, right? Um, and so this question to Kay Bailey a few minutes ago about the BRICS, right? Why is it that 60% of global GDP is aligned against Putin, but only 16% of global population? What, so there's a lot of fence sitters here, right? And part of that, I think, is because we too narrowly define this as our version of, when America talks about democracy outside America, you know, what, what do people think? They think about Vietnam, they think about Iraq, they think about Afghanistan, they think about Libya, they think about Kosovo, and you know, those aren't all ringing success stories outside of this country. David, and I agree, I agree. And David, you're right. Um, it's, uh, it's what kind of world do we want to live in? It's the global order uh, question that you raised. Yeah. But it's also, the answer to the question is, how will Putin's war end? It will only end when he gives up imperialism, when he gives up empire. Um, and, and in order to, for him to give up empire, um, he needs to be defeated. Yeah. He needs to be defeated in Ukraine right now. And probably it means the end of Vladimir Putin. And that could be too. I'm going to talk to you about the last and not least significant question, whether NATO in Ukraine, Ukraine in NATO, which are two different issues. But first, <coughs> can BRICS, U.S. currency as the reserve global currency, is it challenged? Is it threatened? Is it just fine? I think the two biggest threats to the U.S dollar remaining the world's reserve currency is sort of couched in time frames. In the short term, it's debt default. In the long term, it's the rising debt. So you end up with this interesting conundrum where you've got to figure out a way to not default on the debt, but also put a lid on what's going on. This is going to be one of the most intense political debates that we're going to have for years to come. And we see this rise up every now and again, right? And we're in the middle of one right now. But both of those two things actually do significant damage to the value of the dollar in terms of its ability to remain the world's reserve currency. So we've got to get our own act in order first. And if Jim Baker were sitting here in this audience at this point, he would burst out. And how are we going to deal with the magnitude of the book the Treasury is holding right now and the magnitude of U.S. debt to GDP? It cannot go on. Mm -hmm. So. That's a, an echoing here. NATO. NATO in Ukraine, both now and in any potential resolution state, Ukraine in NATO. Contrast, compare, well, and explain. So it's, it's always useful to go to the source documents with these sort of big questions like this. Right? And the source document for NATO is the 1949 treaty. It's called the Washington Treaty, right? This is uh, Harry Truman's president and so forth. It creates NATO, right, 1949. Article 10 of the treaty lays out the answer to your question. How does a state join NATO? And it turns out there are three criteria, right? You have to espouse the democratic values of the alliance, so democracy, individual liberty, rule of law, Ukraine, probably a check, yep. right? You have to be able to contribute to the collective defense. That means that the aspiring state has to contribute to all of NATO's defense, not just its own defense. Ukraine's got the strongest, most capable military in Europe right now, right? Check. Okay, the third criteria, tri criterion is the hang-up. All current members of NATO must agree. So today the vote to, to, uh, to bring in, to, to assess uh, Ukraine has to be 31 to zero. And the reality is we don't have 31 votes. Um, and, and so my concern, is that we so focus on bringing Ukraine into NATO and trying to hammer these 31 votes, and we don't make it, and we fall into the, the trap of wishing we hadn't asked the question, right? So there's an old saying that don't ask the question unless you know the answer, right? And right now, the answer is no. So we should not be 
asking the question at this point. Right. We should not ask it now. Right. But we should ask it when they win. <laughs> when the Ukrainians win, that's the time that they will apply, and that's the time that the question will come up, what's the vote? And, and you know, votes change. You know, you're right. We change, if you take the vote now, then uh, Ukraine will not win. Um, I would hope that the United States would vote yes, but I'm not even sure of that right now. Um, a lot of that will have to do with what does win look like? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But, I mean, but win will be when, uh, yeah, when, when the Ukrainians decide that they've got a, uh, uh, a nation um, that is secure. Uh, for the time being. Uh, they will need a security guarantee this time, unlike the one they got before, which was an assurance, which obviously didn't work. Um, uh, they will need a guarantee. And at that point, um, NATO could be that guarantee. Uh, or the, and alternatively, the guarantee could be bilateral or coalition-based, right? So you could imagine and the US essentially codifying the kind of commitment we've already demonstrated to Ukraine. Which we should do right now. That's exactly right. Why not? The guarantee. Why not? I mean, that's what we're doing right now with, uh, with $35 billion in one year. Right. Uh, providing to the Ukrainians. To, and we to have that kind of assurances with Taiwan, for example, by way of the Taiwan Relations Act. It says, yes. we'll provide Taiwan the means to defend itself. That's and a, we have the same thing with Israel. And we have the same thing with Israel, right? So these are not treaties in the sense of we're going to commit US troops. Uh, but there are, they are binding agreements. And, and by the way, we're already doing it. We're already doing so it. So it's kind of a freebie. It's a freebie. And it doesn't have to be the only thing. We can still keep this NATO membership um, as right. an option. And others would join us, by the way, too. I think the UK would join yep. us. I, my guess is certainly Poland Poles. would join us, the Balts. Yep. So we'd have more than, we wouldn't stand alone here in uh, assuring assistance to Ukraine. Before I turn to the audience, Ken, last question for you. It ends. It ends one way or the other. Putin's there, and it's over. Putin's not there, and it's over. Does Europe go back to Russia as a source of natural gas? Well, who? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, but to a much uh, lower extent than what we saw before, largely because there was structural damage done to one of the main arteries into, into Europe that helped drive European Union, you know, dependence on gas from 26 to 40 percent in less than a decade uh, in the run-up to this, this war. Um, but it's interesting to watch what's happening in Europe. You've got Repower EU, you've got Fit for 55. These are built on really some central pillars, which is, and, and I'm going to say this, and hopefully you realize that two of them are not, they're not consistent, right? One of them is to diversify. One of them is to save and conserve, and the other is to accelerate the deployment of green energy solutions. The first and third that I named are not consistent with one another. That fundamentally creates a problem, because right now, technologically, there's no way to do nothing but green energy without other resources available to a grid to maintain reliability. It will drive up the cost of energy. We've seen that, and I just talked about what that means for economies. There is already pushback within the highest levels of the German government on actually the Green Deal. So you're seeing, you're seeing fractures on what the future of energy will look like. It's difficult to predict, I don't know, right? Um, but I don't see how there is a way in which Europe can actually achieve diversification, continue to grow the use of renewable intermittent resources without relying on international sources of energy because it cannot produce it all domestically. Mm. And so that ultimately means Russia will play a role. Right now, there are Russian cargoes of LNG being delivered into Europe. Right? That is largely being viewed as, well, it's not Russian pipeline gas, so it's okay. Right? But um, as we go forward, make no mistake, you've seen a structural shift in terms of infrastructure. Europe is going to be much more dependent on LNG, which is going to push it into direct competition with growth in Asian markets. And oh, by the way, the Chinese have actually been signing up most of the new long-term deals for LNG, um, most of which are from the United States, believe it or not. Uh, and they'll throw it into their portfolio and figure out the best place to deliver because they've also got coal domestically and other things. But it's going to leave Europe, who is reluctant to sign up long-term deals, reliant on spot cargoes. And that means it's ultimately going to be pulling in gas that's either redirected from China or bought directly from Russia. So 
It's, hmm. there's, I don't see a way out of it, to be honest with you. Thank you all. I'm going to turn to the audience now for questions. Gentleman in the back right there. <coughs> yes. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for uh, all your perspectives. You brought in a lot of <coughs> things that we don't hear about. Um, I appreciate your comment about the narrowness of uh, forecasts or the narrowness in the, in the range of risks that, that might be perceived. And it reminds me, in business, risk evaluations, you've got a reward if successful, and your penalty for failure is just money you don't make. Here, the penalty for failure is going to be qualitative and potentially substantial. In your mind, what are a couple of the scenarios for, um, uh, for failure in, in Ukraine? I'll just do one. Um, so failure in Ukraine. Which, which means the Russians take over Ukraine. I mean, as, as David has just said, that's what uh, Putin has is, is tried to do in, 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 in this unlikely scenario. I don't think it's going to happen. But if Russia were to take over Ukraine, that would do, and Doug's outlined this, uh, that sends this message that big countries can invade small nations. Um, that's, that, that's the rule, of, it's the law of the jungle. Um, and that if you're strong, uh, you can do what you want with your neighbors and you can invade them. You can take their territory. Uh, the second thing, um, downside, is it will, it will demonstrate to the world that just rattling the nuclear saber, just threatening to use nuclear weapons, can get you what you want. Um, and that's what he's done. I mean, he's, 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 and so far he's failing. Again, he is failing, but what's, what he's, this is what he's trying to do. Um, and if he were to succeed in Ukraine, he would succeed in this. And that is to say, look, I'm going to use nuclear weapons, so don't support Ukraine. Don't support them. Um, and the, the scenario that you described is one that we get tired or we get afraid, you know, we're, uh, and we're not going to support you. Then that's what happens. You, uh, Russia, Russia takes over. So those two, that's, that's a bad message. Rule, rule, law of the jungle and, and nuclear works. Yeah, I think nuclear works in the inverse as well. So for those small states that may feel threatened by a large neighbor, right, the logic will be don't do what Ukraine did, which was to give up their nuclear weapons. Yep. Jim Baker, at the fall of the Soviet Union, right, the break of the Soviet Union. At that time, in 91, Ukraine was the third largest nuclear state in the world, right? And largely led by American diplomacy, it gave up its nuclear weapons. They were all returned back to the mother Russia, to the Russian Federation, and it denuclearized, right? For a promise. For, a pro for the Bucharest Agreement, right, which said, we'll guarantee your territorial integrity. Of course, that was a piece of diplomatic paper, right? Uh, but I think the lesson here will be, it could be, for other nuclear aspiring states of, look, that's the ultimate insurance policy against downside risk, right? Get, get a nuclear capability. And, and here, when you think of, you know, even some of our Asian allies may be concerned about our credibility in terms of long-term security guarantees. And maybe it's time for Japan, Korea, uh, and so forth to consider nuclear weapons. So you could see a flurry of nuclear proliferation uh, if this, if Putin is successful. Absolutely, and one last thing, this is, and this is a great question, one last thing. Um, Putin is a criminal, he's, we, we, he's an indicted war criminal, right? I mean, uh, the International cr uh, Criminal Court has already indicted him um, for uh, abducting Ukrainian children, but he's also a war criminal for the decision to invade his neighbor. I mean, the, the crime of aggression is the overall crime. It's under, under the crime of aggression, uh, the decision to invade Ukraine comes atrocities, uh, comes war crimes, comes genocide. Um, and if, Ukra if Ukraine falls and if Russia wins, your scenario, um, then he won't be held accountable. In order for to be some accountability for these atrocities, we've s it's horrible. It is, Tabiel uh, Hudson said, described, it is horrible. What, what the Russians have done to civilians, Ukrainian civilians. We don't even have to go in, it's horrible. Somebody needs to be held accountable. And in order to do that, Ukraine has to win. Over there in the back, please. <clears throat> I attended last week the, uh, the event with the elections and Mark Jones talked about 
um, disengaged people who used to be Republicans and no longer are engaged in ignoring politics. The party's kind of been taken over by people who, who believe in Donald Trump. Um, we have an election next year. Currently, Trump is the front runner on the Republican side. How do we re-engage, or is there an American institution that can start re-engaging Americans to convince them that uh, Zelensky is not corrupt, and that uh, Russia is not the good guys, and that there are all these supporters out there who believe, uh, you know, Lev Parnas helped to get Marie Ivanovich, I believe, fired. Um, because she was trying to fight for corruption. Uh, Dennis Kucinich, you can read about what he's saying about America's role and how it's the globalists who were trying to defeat Russia. How do we counter misinformation in America and make sure that's part of <coughs> the debate next year? I, I fear Donald Trump becoming president and how, what, what's gonna happen with Ukraine? He, you know, the Wagner group attacked American soldiers in Syria, and I don't think he said a word about it. So what can we do? Well, first thing is come out on Monday morning and come to the uh, Baker uh, Institute and, and, you know, participate in this. Get, you know, be informed, right? Read about this and, and participate. Uh, but look, this is a second dimension alongside the energy dimension of Putin's long game, right? He's betting that our internal politics will divide us next year. I mean, it's on the calendar, right? I mean, you can bet on the, beneath the glass cover of his desk side top, his desktop in the Kremlin is a calendar, okay? And on that calendar is our presidential elections and Ukraine's presidential elections next year, right? Uh, and he's gonna bet that we will become so self-absorbed and so disinterested in Ukraine and sort of just tired of it, weary of it, that apathy sets in and indifference sets in um, and that that'll make a difference on the battlefield. So this is, you know, it's fundamentally part of the, the war campaign, part of the project here has to be to stay united and informed and to understand, to the previous question, understand what the downside risks are. They're really quite substantial. They're historic downside risks. So I don't, I'm probably the least qualified here to talk about but, politics, but. No. <laughs> I don't think there's any lack of resolve or discernment of what the right course strategically for the U.S. should be amongst both parties' leaderships in Washington. That's, that's not the issue. It is the lack of outspoken defense of those principles by both parties' leadership in Washington which is the problem. Not that they don't understand or support, they do. And privately make very clear their dismay at the direction things are going in. Well, fine, speak out about it. And the speaking out must start with the president, yeah. who must outline clearly, repeatedly, and in terms Americans understand, and his counterparts abroad who face similar challenges. President Macron is facing riots in the street over raising the retirement age in order to avoid the collapse of the French pension, retirement, and benefits system. Germany, which faces the very significant industrial base uh, diminution challenges, maybe beyond diminution, fundamental decision points being reached, they all have to speak out about this. You know, I use the fun fact the assistance the U.S. provided to Ukraine in 2022, economic assistance, money, is less than two-thirds of what Americans spent on downloaded video game content in 22. But that is not a useful figure or comparison when people in their districts want to know, we don't have this problem here in Harris County, but some people have problems about utilities, flooding, grids, roads, things like that. I know it's a hard lesson for folks here to understand, but there is a world outside Harris County. They've got these troubles. They want to know, why are the checks still being written? How long will those checks still being written? Because they see it, and this is understandable from the perspective of opportunity cost lost. Only a president, only both parties' leaderships can speak coherently to why this matters to you. 
why it matters now, and it will matter hugely over the years ahead, how this turns out. That is not a messaging which, after the Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya endeavors, will take anything other than the best, most carefully constructed and honest messaging from administrations of whatever character they may be and whatever party to convince Americans this is just not another setup for a forever war that the pointy heads or interested parties, and there's a long list of presumed interested parties, want to perpetrate once again upon the long-suffering American people or German people or French people or citizens of the UK. That's what's needed. But we, we can talk and we do we and our counterparts um, in a fashion which is intended to outline the facts as we see them and what could be done for the future. That's our role in all this. But so let me add one thing to that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the question because it, it, de it definitely reflects uh, some of what you see in the general media. Um, but I'll share a, a little story. This, this was a striking moment for me. It was almost two years ago. So we were coming out of COVID. Um, I was at a private dinner, Chatham House Rules, so I'm not gonna tell you who was there, but there were 13 members of Congress, sitting members of Congress at the table, and it was supposed to be a two hour discussion about the future of energy. The conversation very quickly because of the connections via supply chains and green energy turned to China. I was expecting, because it was very evenly split in terms of you know, right and left side of the aisle, I was expecting a really vigorous debate about energy issues and what the future of energy would be and maybe even some diving into to discussion about climate and we didn't even go there. As soon as we got to China, the dinner lasted three and a half hours and nobody disagreed. Nobody. That's a really interesting point because the same type of thing plays to the discussion about Ukraine. So I think Ambassador Satterfield's spot on. If, 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 if President Biden were to actually stand up and beat this drum over and over again, then your concerns largely get pushed down below the surface. Because these are issues that, that leadership on both sides of the aisle agree on. And the same is true. Look, Russia's declining power, a literal dying demographic. China's not. China is a rising yeah. near peer competitor and will be with us for quite a long while to come. Vladimir Putin is gone and hopefully forgotten. But how, when, and what, how, when, and what China does will be very much shaped by the outcome, just as both of our interlocutors, Bill and, and uh, Doug, have said. She's watching this exceedingly closely. And he's playing theatrically those encounters with Putin. Who's the big man? Who's the little man in all of this? It's a reversal of fortune. Who keeps whom waiting? Exactly no, right. All this is, all exactly this. right. She, who is the dominant party here. And he plays that brilliantly, sometimes not too substantively, but brilliantly theatrically, in all of his whirlwind appearances around the world. And it isn't really, unless we make it such, a kick in the gut, a poke in the eye, a defeat for the U.S. It's transactional, opportunistic staging. But it can become more than that if this war in Ukraine by Russia ends in the wrong way. It will feed substance in what is now largely theater on the part of, of China. That is a very bad thing economically, security-wise for the United States and for our allies around the world. Another question. Yes, sir. Um, this question has partially already been answered, but I'm curious if there's a, another answer. Um, and, and the question is, knowing everything you've talked about and everything we're doing currently for Ukraine to help them win, which is hopefully the objective, is there anything other than what you talked about that we're not doing, that we actually could do if we decided to really push to help them win? Well, I'd go back to these, to these longer range systems 
that uh, Bill mentioned. So in military terms, we need a system that can reach out and touch Russia. Uh, it, the forces in occupied Ukraine, so on Ukrainian sovereign territory. But frankly, I'd go a step beyond that. I would consider at least a threat that if Russia continues to strike from inside Russia, long-range strikes inside Ukraine, especially on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, that we would place at risk those launch sites inside Russia. I don't understand as a military professional why we have granted Putin sanctuary for these cruise missile strikes and so forth that come from air bases, you know, the aircraft are launched from Russia, they fly towards Ukraine, they launch with impunity their cruise missiles that, that, that then kill Ukrainian civilians. Likewise, the Black Sea Fleet, you know, positioned in, in uh, Crimea, arms and refits itself on, frankly, sovereign Ukrainian territory, sails into the Black Sea, and then shoots these long-range, very destructive systems against, against Russia. I mean, that's craziness. We've granted our opponent a sanctuary. And by the way, if you go back over military history, there are many success stories where your opponent has a sanctuary. Now, uh, some would argue, well, that will certainly trip the escalation. And that was the reason why. And, and that's the reason why. Uh, but I think there are ways, there are ways you could fashion, a, 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 at a minimum, a deterrent threat, saying that if this persists, we're going to provide the long-range systems to Ukraine. And by the way, we'd be completely justified in doing so by the UN Charter. Article 51 of the UN Charter says, Every member state, every signator uh, to the UN uh, uh, Charter has a responsibility upon request to assist the self-defense of another nation state. That's, that's what we're talking about here. So that's what I would do. I, I, and I think the administration's got to face that eventually because these, look, it, not a week passes without civilian strikes that emanated from outside Ukraine or strikes on civilian territory. And it's just, you know, it approaches well, I won't say immoral, but it approaches, it's unjustified. It's unjustified. It is, the it is the session from the beginning of escalation dominance to the other side. And that is not a good place, whether it was what we right. faced in Iraq with respect to Iran. Right. Afghanistan and the Taliban. Exactly. With the leadership next door in Pakistan. We d I can't think of a an example over the last hundred years where the enemy is granted sanctuary and it, it, didn't turn and out. it turns out well for us. Yeah. Gentlemen, all the way in the back. Ambassador Sattelfield, thank you so much. I'm Consul General of Ukraine. Well, first of all, <laughs> thank you so much for you know, organizing this very important uh, panel uh, discussing the war in Ukraine. And I think it's uh, it's very important that it's organized on the 8th of March, Victory Day in Europe. Yeah. And that, I think, you know, gives you the answer to the question of today's discussion. I think that's what's going to happen, another victory of, uh, uh, you know, in Europe. Because united together uh, with our partners and allies, we, we could win. And uh, you were talking about this during this panel, and we will. But I also think it's important also to talk maybe another panel about what happens after the win. Mm. Uh, because it's just the part one. Victory is just part one. And then uh, we will need uh, contributions from Russia for rebuilding Ukraine. We will need all of those criminals in Russia punished. We will need a tribunal for all of those war crimes committed in Ukraine. Because that's what we're fighting for. I mean, for freedom, regain our territory, but also that those responsible for those horrible crimes uh, be brought to justice. Then again, what happens after that? It's a build uh, to build a big uh, reconstruction fund for Ukraine, and then Ukraine joins EU, and then Ukraine joins NATO. So a lot of other things, you know, also to keep in mind, we can talk about even right now before we reach reach the answer to the question of today's discussion. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. A, a useful reminder, today is VE Day uh, for all but Russia. Uh, tomorrow will be the Great Patriotic Victory uh, commemoration based on when the particular uh, uh, 
surrender agreement. Because of time signed. zones. Yeah. And, yeah. and because of, of REM and Berlin for the two signatures yeah. on, the, on the agreement. Interesting memorial. David, one, just one thing on the uh, very good point about the reconstruction and very good point about the Russians need to pay. So if reconstruction costs $500 billion or, or probably more, uh, there are $300 billion in Western banks, in G7 banks, that, of Russia's central bank reserves. Let me say it. So $300 billion of the $500 billion minimum that we're going to need, $300 billion of Russian money is now controlled by G7 nations. And it's frozen. So the Russians can't get at it. Um, what we need is legislation in each of these countries to be able to seize those funds and put them into an international fund um, that would be managed you know, by, partly by the Ukraine, um, by the Europeans, um, to reconstruct the country. Great. Another question. Yeah. I go on the list. <laughs> this may be a naive question, but I am reading, I'm an observer, that <clears throat> there are, is a massively increased drilling, deep drilling for oil and gas in other countries in Brazil, which is supposed to have phenomenally advanced materials, in Guyana, in numerous other countries, and that there will be more oil and gas and it will rise. <coughs> is, this, is there any truth to this? Mm -hmm. And if there is, what does it mean for Putin's power? <coughs> Well, that's a great way to frame that question. Um, yes, there is a tremendous amount of particularly offshore directed activity uh, in Latin America, so offshore Brazil. Um, you know, everybody knows, have, has heard about, that's familiar with energy, pre-salt developments that have driven Brazil's oil production to be the second largest in the West, Western Hemisphere, so it's already grown a lot. Um, there is a lot of exploration in the equatorial margin, which is north of the pre-salt formations as you approach Guyana. Um, a lot of that geologically is connected to West Africa because of the continental you know, plate movement, right? So you've got a lot of oil and gas resource that is geologically accessible, and because of advances in, in technology, we're going after it. Uh, higher prices, the world's thirst for energy uh, is driving what you're seeing in Guyana as well. Um, lots of oil has been discovered there. ExxonMobil and Hess are two of the largest operators in the region. Um, ExxonMobil, I think, is the operating partner between the S, Exxon, JV. But yes, make no mistake, there's a lot of oil that will be coming online from those countries. Um, a lot of it will need to be refined. So where it goes to be refined, to be refined remains to be seen. Probably going to find a pretty nice home in the United States, which will then export products to Europe. Um, this is a, a trend that's already begun. Um, but yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of oil. Um, that's coming on in other places. But you've got to realize that some of that is offsetting declines in mature basins. So you've got a lot of maturity in the North Sea, for example, and so there's a little prospect for growth there. So this will help offset that. Um, Russian oil is still finding its way to market. I think what remains to be seen, speaking of uncertainty, is how long that lasts. Because um, the sanctions will actually put pressure on operations and maintenance of existing facilities and really crimp the ability for Russia to grow production. So I don't think we've seen the full ramifications of sanctions on Russian oil production yet. Uh, it's likely though, even with everything that you asked about, we're going to see a tighter market for a while to come. Um, largely because capital is seeking the best, greatest, the, the greatest possible returns at the moment. And for the last decade plus, that has not been in oil and gas. Things have changed over the last year and a half, and you're starting to see more capital flow back into the sector. But it takes for an offshore development between five and seven years before first production. So you've still got a long runway. So we're in for a rough ride for the next next few years. Eventually. Eventually. In the world. Yes. That is definitely true. Hey, uh, thank you all for the excellent panel. And um, just, we touched upon it earlier, uh, I think a lot of people give Biden a lot of credit for making the decision to risk, you know, potential sources to in the months ahead of the war to say this is real, this is what happened, this is, Putin's very serious about this. Uh, earlier this year, something similar 
you know, intelligence uh, uh, agencies said, we, we have traffic, we have, I guess, signals intelligence, say the Chinese are possibly considering, you know, increasing armaments that they would supply to the Russians. Maybe that just came from Russian sources uh, that we tapped into. Uh, and then it seemed to kind of go away. The Chinese said, we're not doing this. The Biden administration said, we believe actually that the Chinese are not pursuing this. What's the reality of that? Um, and in terms of if the Chinese were to actually step in in a large way in terms of military you know, weaponry support, obviously that could prolong the war, the war for years. What, what do you think the reality of China's position is? I think you've got the story about right. I mean, there, there were early intelligence reports and then after more consideration, they sort of dried up and, and, and blew away. So I, I don't think that there's any evidence now, at least in the public arena, that China is providing meaningful support to, uh, to Russia. If, if China were to change that policy and provide the kind of assistance we're providing to Ukraine, China provide to Russia, that's a game changer because it, it exposes the Chinese um, hypocrisy in its position, which today is we have a, a partnership without limit with Russia, but we support national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Well, these are fundamentally incompatible. Uh, and if they vote on the form in the form of partnership with Russia, then it's quite clear where they stand in terms of territorial integrity and national sovereignty. And it really does, it, it would be a game changer at, at the geostrategic level. And it turns out that, that uh, and David, you described this earlier in terms of releasing information. Uh, in this case, it did work. Apparently, uh, we released information, said that, hey, we've heard um, that you're about, the Chinese are about to provide uh, uh, 152 ammunition to the Russians. And, they're, and the Russians are short of that. They really need it. And we said, don't do it. We know you're about to do it, don't do it. And they haven't. So far, they haven't. And if they were to, um, they would lose, they'd be subject to big, big time sanctions. Uh, they're two big markets, of course, in Europe and the United States. Uh, they don't want to jeopardize that. So I think, the, I think this worked. I think this worked. You know, it's interesting when we talk about this before the invasion, exposure or disclosure of American intelligence, and some would say, well, it didn't work. You know, the, he invaded anyway. Where it did work was it gave us about three or four months of diplomacy to assemble the diplomatic pieces so that once he did invade, sanctions, work at NATO, military assistance to Ukraine kicked in very, very quickly. So we got a head start on, on the response to an invasion, even though we didn't stop the invasion. So I give this intelligence disclosure process uh, high marks. We bought ourselves three or four months. Yes. Thank you. Mark Schroeder, I'm glad you included Ken here because I think energy is a key part of this. And I heard the senator talk about energy security. You mentioned it. And I hear President Biden or what the administration talking energy security. Well, timing makes a big difference. And energy security, if you're talking about we need to have clean, all American, it's going to be a huge wealth transfer to other nations to make that happen, CO2. So, Ken, when you talk energy security, near term, what do you mean? It's a great question. Um, for those of you, that there's so he's asking, when you talk energy security near term, what do you mean? Um, energy security is not new. As a matter of fact, last year at our annual energy summit, we, we had a, an entire panel discussion on energy security, and the subheader was what's old is new again, right? Because um, you have to realize that you've got an entire generation that's basically grown up in the absence of a major shock to energy markets. And there are a lot of people saying things and proposing things that, quite frankly, we've already done and know they don't work, but here we are again. Um, uh, so just a reminder, history can be a good you know, teller of, of what might come. But um, when we talk about energy security, we're really talking about avoiding the macroeconomic dislocations associated with these shocks, either shocks to availability of supply or price shocks. And sometimes what gets commingled in that, well, is we just need to get off foreign oil. This was a, a, a mantra since the 70s, actually, right? Um, we know that doesn't matter. The oil market is one of the most globally interconnected and fungible markets, so a shock anywhere has implications everywhere. 
that is very different today than what it was in the 70s and as a result it's actually a more secure commodity because it is more fungible so one of the biggest lessons is how do you actually increase fungibility in energy markets so that you can replace disruptions with other supplies that inevitably means that you increase the number of trading partners you have which is something Europe hasn't done over the last decade and you increase the number of different energy sources that you can draw on, which is also something that Europe hasn't done over the last decade. So on both counts, they literally placed all their eggs in one basket. That's a problem. And it's as if, quite frankly, with Repower EU and Fit for 55, they know they've got a bad, bad hand in poker and they're gonna double down. <laughs> it's, 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 I think this is where some of the fractures that I was referring to are really gonna come to, sh they're gonna shine through in the next five years. You're already seeing elements of that. There's going to be some problems that will be revealed um, through household energy bills, through, I mean, you are, you, I mean there's already, you know, protests, right? I mean, at, at, the, at the public level. So um, when we talk about energy security, it really is about diversification. And that's ultimately what, U.S. is in a really beautiful place because we have everything, which is why energy expenditure share last year was 3.7%. That's in the middle of a major oil price disruption. That's in the middle of all of the press being focused on, we've got to do something to get energy bills down. What's remarkable is the energy expenditure share of, uh, uh, in the US has actually declined over the last 20 years pretty steadily. From and around 5% down to around 3, 3.5%. When you look at what's happened in Europe, it's gone the other way. Right, which is why those economies have slowed down so dramatically. And to your point about what we spend on video game downloads, you know, durable goods expenditures in the US, if you want to know where expenditure share is rising, it's on that. It's iPhones and TVs and computers. And it, r remarkably, healthcare is actually relatively flat over the last 20 years, too. So the two things you hear about in the news all the time, which are energy and healthcare, those are not the things that are rising in terms of personal consumption expenditures. It's actually durable goods which has direct connections to both Russia and China, by the way. And, and just an aside, which I cannot resist at sure. this point, um, a little note of explanation on a, a less, of a less breathless character than much of the U.S. and international press reports. What's going on with Mohammed bin Salman and Vladimir Putin? The answer is not a rocket science assessment. Yeah. You got two leaders in control of command economies and economic market decision making, both of whom have a real Putin, self-defined MBS, existential requirement for hundreds of billions of dollars, which they can only get from hydrocarbons. And they need to get it as much as they can, as quickly as they can. Everything else, every other rational, irrational consideration apart each of them has this, and for now at least, OPEC Plus is being pulled along in the wake of these two individuals' need. Putin's is a more finite but critical need. MBS is, is an excessive, basically, there is not enough money in the hydrocarbon economy of the world to give him the cash he needs for his projects. Vision 2030. Right? Vision 2030. But he will pursue until the market will no longer allow production cuts. The calculus will work against. But it isn't a complex thing. It has little to do with the US or Joe Biden or anybody else. It has to do with these two individuals' need for cash. And hydrocarbons are the only way they can get it. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, Putin's health, you know, real or imagined, and the depth and the strength of aligned leadership beneath Putin. Bill? So, uh, I don't know if Bill Burns uh, addressed this when he, he was did. here. And he uses the same line he uses uh, in every when he's asked, he, When he's asked how <laughs> healthy is Putin, Bill Burns says, too healthy. <laughs> <laughs> That was built in private as well as in public. So the short answer is we don't know. Uh, I don't know. And if Bill Burns doesn't know, then we don't know um, about, about the health question. But, you, but your question, the next question is interesting as well. 
that is below, you know, around Putin. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how if Ukraine wins, when Ukraine wins, uh, uh, when Ukraine wins, um, that could be bad news for Putin. You know, oftentimes in Russian history, others will know this better than I, probably Ron knows this much better than I, it, it doesn't go well. When Russia loses a war, uh, the leader sometimes has a real hard time. That could happen this time as well. Then the question is yours, who's below him? Well, it's probably not the opposition. It's probably not Navalny who's in jail and probably going to be poisoned to death. Before. It's probably not the opposition because the, op the oppression is so intense. Uh, Putin's got such control over that country right now, the information, the media. It's probably not going to come from the opposition. It's not pr probably not going to come from the streets. Um, he's got problems on his right. He's got problems from these Russian nationalists um, who, are, who are arguing to him or blasting him, or at least his minister of defense, for not being tough enough, you know, not being harder on the Ukrainians than, uh, than they are. You know, how come we haven't rolled into Ukraine? So he's got problems on his right, and he may have problems within the government. That is, if he makes so many bad decisions that he loses the confidence of people around him. This has happened also in Russia, in Soviet history. Um, uh, he could be shown the door. Uh, he could be say, hey, boss, we got this dacha for you at, uh, outside. We'll take care of you. We got this now. And this could be, this could be uh, Medvedev um, as this kind of, you know, he used to be president. Now he's kind of off the deep end crazy. But nonetheless, uh, he's, he's got the, const he's the deputy national security um, uh, or. Uh, and then there's the you know the prime minister um, uh, who probably doesn't have it. But then there is the head of uh, uh, of the security council. So there are a couple of people around him where you you, you could imagine that happening. Last thing, um, I was on a panel like this with uh, with one of Bill Burns' predecessors, um, and uh, he said uh, that uh, he, he's watched the stability of the Russian Russia or Soviet leadership over over his whole career, and he said the 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 probability um, of a change, uh, of something happening to Putin, is higher now than it's ever been. He doesn't say wh how high that is, but it's higher now than it's ever been. So watch this space. Although for a contrarian view, from an old Middle East hand, where the, the, you look at the most incredibly dysfunctional regimes, who just are screwing up everything possible, and you wonder to yourself, why no change? answer is mabab, which in Arabic is, and what after? Which is the misery you're enduring now, the dysfunction you're experiencing at the moment, is probably better <laughs> than the uncertainty of the pain and dysfunction and disaster that will follow. Yeah. And f I ask the question, for the oligarchs, for the Russian Orthodox Church, <coughs> a co-collaborator with Vladimir Putin in so many things, if he goes, if he dies tonight, who do they find that is as useful to them as he is? And if there's a fear here, it's not the fear of if we move against him, what does he do to us? But where are we? Who do we have who can represent us as effectively and our system as this guy has? You know, we should remember that autocratic regimes like this have this appearance of sort of invincibility and durability and so forth, right? But over and again, they prove brittle. And the challenge here is that whatever happens to Putin, they have 6,000 nuclear weapons, okay? So, I mean, there's a fundamental sort of tension here between we'd really like to see him go and have them move on to something better, but the chaos that's likely to ensue involves the security of 6,000 nuclear weapons. So we kind of missed that. We, 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 we avoided that problem with the breakup of the Soviet Union by way of James Baker and many others consolidating the USSR's weapons into the Russian Federation. Could we do it again if the Russian Federation fragments? So if we've done it once, we could do it again. I mean, that's, that's a possibility. And we got to bring Baker out of retirement. Bring Baker out of retirement. <laughs> and, but, but the other lesson there is his president, George H.W. Bush went to Ukraine um, at the, in, in uh, 19, uh, 1991. 
in the spring of 1991. He went to, he went to Ukraine. So still the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union hadn't broken up yet. Um, and George H.W. Bush went to Kiev and, and, and gave a speech telling the yeah. Ukrainians, keep, keep calm, you know, don't, don't rock the boat. You know, don't rock the, the Soviet boat. Don't, don't make problems for the Soviet Union. Um, and that is now known as the Chicken Kiev speech. Um, <laughs> and we shouldn't do another Chicken Kiev speech. If that ha you know, we should just, we should support the Ukrainians as we've talked about doing. Um, and whatever happens in the, in, in the, in the Kremlin will happen. Uh, then, we have, then we need the James Bakers to kind of clean it up. Uh, but we shouldn't be afraid of supporting the Ukrainians because of what might happen in the Kremlin. I'm going to ask you all for, for closing comments right now. And, and Ken, I'm going to end with you because uh, economics always have the closing word on just about <laughs> anything, everywhere, <laughs> for all time. Not us. Bill? Yep. So, sure. Um, uh, I, I mentioned there are, there are two scenarios um, on, uh, and maybe more, but there are at least two scenarios of how this, how this war ends. And it could be short, could be long. Um, the short one is Ukrainians get the support they need um, in order to break through, <coughs> and, uh, and the long one is they don't. So we have a lot to say about how long this war goes. Um, if we support the Ukrainians right now with the kinds of things Doug talked about, uh, they can win. That's the other message. They can win. Um, uh, but we need to help. Doug? Yeah, I'll finish where I started, which is this is fundamentally unpredictable. I mean, I agree the odds increase if we provide them the sorts of things they're lacking, but there's no sure path here. And even as this tactical counteroffensive kicks off here in the coming weeks and the weather permitting and all that sort of thing, uh, that's completely unpredictable. And this is, we should, we should understand this. Look, as Americans, we're an engineering community. We're an engineering culture, right? We imagine that we can connect the dots in a meaningful way and be productive. That's not war, OK? War is fundamentally, uh, unimaginably tragic and unpredictable. So we should watch this space carefully. Ken. Lots to chew on. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. But there is one thing I want, hopefully, you, you can all take away from this discussion with is the future of energy, yes, it's uncertain, but one thing is always true when you actually have conflict and ultimately regime change, which will happen in some form or fashion on the back end of this, energy production in the directly affected countries declines. That is a universal truth. It has happened in every single instance where this has occurred. So when we think about the future of the global energy system and the future of energy security that, quite frankly, up until now, Russia had been a mainstay of because of the amount of natural gas it produces, the amount of crude oil it produces, the amount of coal it produces and exports all of them. Uh, uranium, what do you need to refuel nuclear reactors in Europe? Well, it's a lot of that's coming from Russia. So if you see declines in production in Russia on the heels of however this resolves, that will put a lot of pinch points on global supply chains that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. And the one thing that we have to be able to do is have the resolve to keep our energy supply lines as diversified as possible. Don't paint ourselves into a picture, because if we do, the pain will last for over a decade. And that's not something I don't think anybody wants to see happen. And I would add to the energy piece of what you just said, something that isn't talked about very much. Fertilizer, oh yeah, grain, and refined grain products. Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, collectively, are the major source of fertilizer for all of Africa, particularly the East. East Africa is in, once again, an historic famine. Some of its climate some of it was the inability to access fertilizer and seed in order to plant and then doubling down the absence of grain yeah. and milk product to substitute for what they cannot grow themselves. This is one of the huge and sadly untold consequences of this horrific yeah. Russian campaign. Yeah, we didn't even get into that, but 25% of the world's wheat exports comes from basically the wheat belt in Ukraine and Russia. 
so that shared there. And it's that's one of those scary. aftershocks, yeah, absolutely. you know, that, okay. that you don't anticipate. Um, but because of that, they have a massive um, ammonia production, uh, which goes directly into fertilizer production, which to your question earlier, it's an area that some of the countries, particularly in Brazil and Guyana, are looking to actually develop ammonia production for fertilizer manufacture. So we could see a real seismic shift in that place. But it's, there's going to be some pain in the interim. I want to thank our panelists. And Kay, this was an extraordinarily deep and thoughtful discussion of a critical issue. It will not be the last, uh, which our speakers here or this institute or the American Academy, I suspect, will be engaged in. But thank you all uh, for coming here. This really was uh, quite exceptional. Your questions were, as always, outstanding. And my particular thanks to the Academy, to the Cisco <coughs> Forum, Ron, to you um, for your efforts in making this possible. Uh, concluding remarks on your behalf. Just, just to take the opportunity to reciprocate the thanks for your cooperation, David, for Baker Institute, for bringing us all together in this way uh, furthers both our missions. I don't think I need to expand on that except to ask for a hand for the Baker Institute. Programs like this are made possible by the generous support of <laughs> viewers like you. <laughs> and, and while we hope, certainly, um, you support and appreciate the work done by the American Academy. Um, all of us uh, here at the Baker Institute um, who provide these kinds of fora for discussion um, look to your support as well to continue to make all of this uh, the level of quality, content, and participant level that we've been able to